What up, Wizards? It is Dev, SBMTG. We like it a magic, and I've got something a little bit different for you today because this is usually the time of the season where I would drop the like top three or top five decks in standard video in the new format, you know, but I actually don't think we have quite enough data to produce that video yet. Still got to wait for a couple of more tournaments to crack off before we get that one out, but we have had a couple of MTGO challenges here in the early days of the season that do include the new cards from Lost Caverns of Ixalan. So instead today, we're going to do something that I think is arguably more interesting to some folks at least, and that is a little kind of a top 10 here of all the cards from the new set that are seeing play over these first couple of challenges. Number five will shock you. Put that in the thumbnail, good old-fashioned YouTube clickbait, but I will say all of the cards on this list, their placement is determined by how much play they've actually seen over the course of these first couple of challenges, so some of these cards might actually surprise you, just the fact that they're on these lists at all. However... Conversely, there are going to be some cards that show up here as sort of honorable mentions right here at the beginning that I want to go ahead and get to, don't want to waste too much of your time, that nonetheless weren't in the most impactful lists. For instance, cards like Sanguine Evangelist showed up in the top 32 of the MTGO challenge towards the bottom of these lists and sort of Imidane's Recruiter Boros list. I believe there's one Sanguine Evangelist and an Azorius list as well. So this card has shown up a couple of times, but hasn't like top eighted or top 16 just yet in the limited data set that we have. Same thing with Cinete Scout. This showed up in one list over the last weekend. And again, I believe it's a top 32 list. Uh, I even think that the player cutting this card may have cut it from their deck for the second MTGO challenge and done better. Not just because they cut this card, their deck was different, but they were still playing like a gruel list, you know, and I believe their second list was actually much more dinosaur focused and ended up cutting Cinete Scout among a couple of other cards. So this card has seen play, but I believe even the player playing it ended up cutting it. There's also a player on Simic Merfolk at the very bottom of the, I believe, first MTGO challenge of the season. I believe they really are uh, number 32 in that. No shame. It's still a very good placement, right? It's, they're playing Merfolk. So it also, they were also playing Cenote Scout. Does look like a strong card, but it hasn't shown up too much. That said, 300 card set. And this is one of the few cards to actually show up, so it does deserve some due here. It's also Kellen Daring Traveler, which has showed up in more than one list, um, just like a couple of these other cards here, but hasn't necessarily been one of the more impactful cards in those lists, to the best of my knowledge. It's usually a two of, right? But it too is occasionally an Imidane Recruiter list. Sometimes it shows up in Humans lists and stuff too, so an interesting card to pop up here and there, and in different lists as well. Also, Spyglass Siren, I believe this is kind of the last honorable mention, uh, but there is an Azorius kind of aggro mid-range tokens <laughs> kind of pile going around standard right now that has had mixed results. Sometimes it does really well, sometimes it does kind of middling, right? But this has shown up in at least two of those lists that I've seen over the weekend, and I wanted to point it out too. A pretty decent little value creature, no surprise that it showed up. Now, the final sort of honorable mention that I want to point out here is Spelunking, not because it showed up in a ramp list. I think a lot of people, myself included, called that this will show up in ramp lists, even if you don't play that many caves, right? Because you can play Triomes after it, they come into play untapped. It's a really good benefit for those decks. So it's not a surprise that it showed up. The surprise, to my mind at least, is that I only saw one, like a Traxa domain ramp deck in both of the top 32s for both MTGO challenges. Um, and that is one of the better decks in standard. I don't know if people just weren't playing it in the first couple of challenges, but I was very surprised by the lack of ramp in general. So I'm mostly using spelunking here as a jumping off point to talk about how little ramp there actually was over the first couple of real events of the season and whether or not that's a good sign or a bad sign. I don't really know. It's kind of subjective. We did see a ton of aggro. There are kind of a lot of aggro decks over the first couple of challenges. Now, you know, conventional wisdom says that in the early days of a format, when there's a new set and things are uncertain, fastest deck tends to win. So I'm not surprised that while other decks are sort of developing how they're supposed to use their slots and all that, aggro decks that went on turn four took a lot of the early challenges this season. That is something to be expected, but I do still think it's interesting that the ramp decks either did so poorly or were expected to do so poorly that no one bothered playing them in the first place. So... Only one player that I saw braved playing an actual Atraxa ramp deck, and they did play Spelunking, but again, very, very few players were on that deck towards the beginning of the season. Moving on to the actual list, finally here, uh, starting at number 10, is O'Hare Axenil, Deepest Might. Um, turns out that Anvil 
showed up, I believe, in the hands of the same player at both MTGO challenges so far this season. Now, they did not top 16, and I want to point that out, so grain of salt and all. But the player did fairly well on O'Hare Axenil, O'Hare Axenil. Uh, with Oni Cold Anvil, which I think is an interesting little combo. They're also playing Voldar and Epicure, which does a damage when it comes into play. That means it does four damage if you have an O'Hare in play. So really, really interesting. I talked with uh, Power Dragon a bit about this card and all the things that it can do. And Anvil and Voldar and Epicure are some of the things that he mentioned. Turns out he was 100% right to think about this card in context of Anvil and those other cards and stuff. It looks like it could be at least a decent deck, if not like S or A tier, then at least one of those like B tier decks. It's really fun to play and can steal a win sometimes. And if you actually get, you know, into the mid game, Right. I think that in a format full of aggro, this could do some stuff if it uses its slots correctly and sort of, you know, again, corrects its posture from the first couple of days of standard. If it does find a way to flex its slots in order to sort of address the issues that it has in standard, I think this one actually might have a shot. Axonil is a really, really sweet card and a finally at four drop that actually sort of helps the... Um, the only cold anvil decks work, <laughs> you know, we keep getting promised that this is the four drop that's going to make the deck work and it just never does. But Axonil is kind of looking promising in the early days here. We also got to see Tarion's journal in these, um, in these decks, sort of an honorary mention alongside Axonil for number 10 here, because in basically, you know, every time you see <laughs> only cold anvil now, you'll see Tarion's journal as a one or two of alongside it. So I want to point this card out too. It's seeing play, but again, just like Axonil only in the anvil decks right now. Aside from that, NT coming up next. Okay, so there is a um, sometimes Boros, sometimes Jeskai, sometimes Naya, but mostly Boros <laughs> sort of aggro-y thing here. It's half tokens deck, you know, just wants to get in very quickly. And NT is a relatively important part of that deck. Um, it combos really well with a card that we'll see a little bit later in this video, and it combos on curve with that card as well. So really interesting include here. I thought this would be an auto include in mono red, but mono red's actually been doing fairly well in the early days here, top eighting both MTGO challenges, if I'm not mistaken. And neither, you know, of those decks, much less the other mono red decks that are all scattered throughout both top 32s, elected to play NT. I don't know that I saw this in a single mono red list, which kind of surprised me. But you do see it in a sort of one of the only new emergent builds in the new standard. This kind of Boros aggro that isn't specifically Imidane's recruiter. It's kind of another breed of Boros aggro um, that sometimes, again, like splashes other colors and stuff like that. So Inti was integral to those sort of, of decks um, over the weekend. And I think it's just a really cool two drop that mostly got played for the synergy and not for just the raw sort of ceiling of its power level. So interesting include here for some decks, but I think that some of the other cards in the decks that this card is in ended up seeing more play for one reason or another over the weekend. So let's look at belligerent yearling next. This is actually, uh, what is this number eight? <laughs> yeah, sure. Number eight is belligerent yearling, but not really. It's dinosaur stuff. There's a lot of dinosaur stuff over the weekend. We saw at least three dinosaur decks perform somewhat well. We even saw one player, um, <laughs> not do super well in the first challenge with their dinosaur build and then sort of revamp their dinosaur build to include more dinosaurs <laughs> and do better in the next challenge. So belligerent yearling has been a part of all of these decks that have been important so far. If there is a you know creature type that is made out well in the early days, it has been dinosaurs, but yearling has been a part of them. Pugnacious hammer skull has been a part of this and the only green black deck like green black sort of even mid range deck that I've seen very low. I think in the first um, MTGO challenge of the season is a fight rigging deck that played pugnacious hammer skull. So this shard card has showed up a couple of times in lists over the first few days of the season. So I wanted to point it out. Scythe claw Raptor is all is in the dinosaur builds. Exali's lore keeper in the dinosaur builds. It's Kinth in the dinosaur builds and hulking Raptor has shown up in not only a dinosaur build, but also a sort of rampy, you know, gruel build as well that I kind of really like the look of. So this card showing up in more than one list, not just dinosaurs. And then Polani's Hatcher is even getting in on the fun. This was in one of the more winning dinosaurs list in one of the challenges. And finally, Triumphant Chomp uh, getting in as a removal spell. So a lot of dinosaur stuff, man, you know, <laughs> it's like the dinosaur deck as a matter of course, because it has to, right? It plays like 20 or 24 new cards in it. So dinosaurs is actually a thing making a small mark in the early days of the season here for LCI. So I like seeing them, but moving on to number seven, look at restless anchorage. This is not a creature lands entry 
just for just restless anchorage that's it this shows up not only in the occasional soldiers build i even saw it in a, a mono white humans build that splashed blue in the mana base for reckless restless anchorage which is such a strange thing to do but still this card is showing up in basically every deck that can produce blue white there was a blue white control deck that got 10th place in one of the challenges obviously it played restless anchorage so i think that the prediction over spoiler season was basically any deck that can play this card is going to play this card and that hasn't been true of all the creature lands it turns out that if you know boros doesn't necessarily play restless bivouac every time because it needs its untapped lands right so and that is held true over the start of the season but anchorage no even in the aggro decks anchorage will show up and it's just such a good creature land too but number six is Anim Pakal. Is that? Yeah, making sure it wasn't number five. <laughs> Anim Pakal has shown up in this like sort of brand new archetype that I was talking about earlier with Inti. And Inti, it combos really well with. I just brought this up as well. You get Inti on turn two. And then Anim Pakal um, on turn three. And eventually Inti will start putting plus one, plus one counters on Anim Pakal, which will create more gnomes, which is just a really, really sweet one, two. So, well, really two, three <laughs> sort of curve. So... I like that aspect of it, but this deck also plays just a whole bunch of new cards. We'll see another one of them at number five. Um, I think that is, uh, the decks that I've seen that um, run this card not only are somewhat plentiful, I think there's at least five or six of these decks in the first couple of challenges, but they also tend to run at least 20 brand new cards. Um, well, they devote, let me put it this way, they devote 20 slots to brand new cards, so... That's kind of a lot of new cards, you know, so I'd say an Impical plus a couple of other cards like NT and one that we're about to look at have again spawned, not a brand new archetype, it's just Boros Aggro, but, you know, in a form that we haven't seen in a really long time, so, you know, a lot of people are excited about this card in Standard, especially to go along with a card like Adeline, which is in these decks with the with an Impical, <laughs> you've just got like the best three drops in white in Standard, right, so no surprise this card showed up, but in a way, it kind of is. <laughs> I wasn't sure the card would perform to this level so early. So we'll see if it holds. We'll see if the Imidane's Recruiter builds are sort of better than this. There are builds with an Impical that also play Imidane's Recruiter. So keep that in mind. But, you know, from what I've seen so far over the beginning of the season, mostly people are choosing between those two builds. Um, and an Impical is coming out on top at the beginning, but that might just be because people don't know how to play against this build quite yet, whereas they're more familiar with the play lines from the Recruiter deck. So kind of hard to judge, but this card is already getting a foothold, and I like that. Along with number five, Warden of the Inner Sky. I have pooped on this card a little bit during previous season. I didn't much care for it until the moment I played against it during early access. I played against it maybe four or five times that same night. Um, during early access, and every time I learned to respect it a little bit more, but even the initial time I played it, the first time it was uh, dropped against me, you immediately start realizing that the card is actually pretty stout, and if you don't do something about it, it's going to get big and you know have evasion later in the game. So It also helps fix their draws and stuff, and the fact that they only do it as a sorcery doesn't matter in the early turns. Not really, because I don't know, a lot of times in the early turns, I'm not really looking to attack anyway. I can take crackback damage because it's like turn three. Who cares? So this card actually proved to be great to me in the first few games that I played against it. And it turns out that it was, in fact, <laughs> a very good card. This is not only showing up in those Boros lists that I've been blabbering on about this whole video so far, but it's also in a couple of blue white lists. Obviously the soldiers list play it. It's in one of the uh, mono white humans lists that I've seen. At least it might be in a couple of the mono white humans lists because those are doing well too. But long story short, this deck is showing up or this card is showing up in at least three decks, if not four, because there's, there's another like Azorius kind of an aggro mid range, not soldiers like Azorius aggro, not soldiers. <laughs> this card is also showing up in. So just really, really seeing a lot of play here. <laughs> you know, it is replacing the guy that like gets plus one, plus one counters and then like blows up artifacts or enchantments. It's more or less replace that guy. And it does become like a big threat mid game. So, you know, when I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I didn't much care for the look of this card, but it has been pretty impactful in the early days of the season. Now, number four here, kind of a boring pick, but it's get lost. This is showing up in basically everything that plays white. <laughs> so everything, you know, like Esper, Mono White Humans, um, Blue White Soldiers, the aforementioned Blue White sort of mid-rangey aggro deck. All of them. <laughs> Just If you play planes in your deck, or even if you don't, you know, <laughs> like three players, three colors or something, you don't have room for planes. You're still playing this. Um, just, an, just an incredible piece of removal. From what I can tell, um, 
basically everyone that's playing it is playing either, you know, a two of because they're aggro and they don't have all the slots for removal or whatever, or they're playing a four of because they're control and it's the best removal spell in standard. So it's just really, really fantastic piece here. It's already proven itself to be a huge spread of targets. We all knew it was probably the best removal spell in the set, but confirmation in the early days, at least, is, you know, we're, we're getting that. So <laughs> Get Lost is every bit as good as we kind of presumed it was. But everybody likes a clean removal spell, you know? But Malcolm up next here at number three, breaking into the top three. This is showing up, not necessarily, in Esper Legends. I have seen it in one Esper Legends list as a two of. But what it's mostly showing up in is that blue-white deck. Again, blue-white, not soldiers, but still kind of aggro, but kind of mid-range. We play Wedding Announcement, you know, it's like just kind of a weird-looking deck. And when we actually do get around to the top five new decks of the format in a few days... That's probably going to be one of the decks that we talk about, spoilers and all that, but that's a really interesting looking deck because it isn't soldiers, but it is kind of aggro, but it is kind of tempo, but not really. It's really weird. It is kind of like get you in the early game, but I could play tempo if that's what the game I want to play. Depends on if I'm on the play or the draw or whatever. Then late in the game, I'll just stop. I'll start like, you know, waiting announcements got me a bunch of tokens and I got wandering emperor out and all that stuff. So Really interesting sort of transitional deck that can do different things depending on where the game state is. So I like that. And Malcolm appears to be a relatively big part of that deck. You know, you can play it at tempo. It's got flash. Um, it gets you the cards and everybody likes the cards. So this is showing up in a couple of different decks and uh, really kind of establishing itself so far this season. I've seen it in more decks than just the two that I've mentioned, but those are sort of the big ones that are producing the most results in the early days here. So we'll move on to Deep Cavern Bat Baby. Esper is kind of everywhere. It was decent in the first challenge of the season. We saw a few Esper decks that were doing some stuff, but in the second challenge of the season, the first, yeah, the top four decks, three of them are Esper. And one of them is the, yeah, the first place deck, the second place deck, the fourth place deck. They're all Esper decks. Third place deck is that blue-white deck that I was just talking about. All the Esper, I believe there's actually five, at least four Esper decks in the top eight of that second MGGO challenge. So Esper again taking over the format. And Deep Cavern Bat has been a surprisingly big part of that for some. But not for all. I've been trying to tell everybody how good a Kite Sail Freebooter with Lifelink is. It's actually, again, it's better than Kite Sail Freebooter. It hits more card types. And that's really, really good. Taking the Sunfall out of your opponent's hand or the Wandering Emperor or whatever they're trying to get you with. You know, they just take the Atraxa out of their hand. Or you get the removal spell out of their hand so that they have to find your removal spell to kill Deep Cavern Bat, which means they have to find another removal spell to kill. You know what I mean? Like, it's just... It's pretty ridiculous some of the time what this card can do in terms of like getting rid of problematic cards, stalling the game state for your opponent while you pull ahead. So really sweet. This also combines very nicely with Rafine on curve, right? It's got flying, it's got lifelink. So if you drop this on two, take an important card out of their hand, again, removal spell some of the time, then drop Rafine. Well, what a situation they're in now, right? Because you can swing for the Deep Cavern Bat. You can connive because of the Rafine. It becomes a 2-2 Flying Lifelink. If you get in, which you probably will because it has Flying on turn 3, then you deal extra damage. You go up on life. You got a card away from them. Now they have to deal with the Deep Cavern Bat before they can really deal with the Rafine. If they want to deal with the Rafine, that's totally fine. But, you know, if you took a removal spell with the Deep Cavern Bat, they want to draw a removal spell to kill the bat and then kill the Rafine. But if they want to do that, they still have to pay an extra mana to kill the Rafine because of the ward. It's just a ridiculous... <laughs> Esper is a ridiculous deck because of this card on two. Um, and again, not a surprise. Just being able to take whatever problem for the matchup they have out of their hand. Absolutely. <laughs> non-land is basically unconditional. Um... Like it, does, it does say non-land, but, you know, in terms of discard, basically not unconditional. Um, on turn two, that also has a body. So it doesn't matter if they get the card back. They still have to, like, waste time and energy and mana getting rid of the bat. And that's really worth a lot of your time. Trust me, especially when you're planning on dropping Rafine into Shieldred. So just a ridiculous looking card. <laughs> it has been you know, very, very good in the early days of the format. Um, there is an Esper deck that's done really well so far that only plays like 12 creatures. <laughs> it's like Rafine, this, and something else is a four up. And, you know, that turns out that's all you need. You don't need, oh, Dinnick. Dinnick is the other guy. It's like four Dinnick, four Rafine, four Deep Cavern Bad. It just prioritizes getting a two drop into Rafine, having a decent attack. And I'm sure it just obliterates mono red decks, right? Because Rafine and Deep Cavern Bad 
do very well against. They have lifelink, you know? So if you put counters on them, they do unbelievably good against mono red. So just, just a great card here. Um, just a great card. And I thought everyone knew that, but I kept seeing people say like, nah, dude, deep cavern bad's bad. And why did you think that? Uh, number one though, is yet another card that keeps showing up at Esper, but it also shows up in this like mystery blue white deck, the mysterious, the enigmatic blue white deck. And that is, uh, easily, easily, not only the most played card in standard of LCI so far, but it's in the most successful decks of LCI so far. And it might be a huge part of why those decks are so successful. And it is amazingly subterranean schooner. Um, during previous season, I talked about how like this was, this might be really good. And I thought that I was going nuts. Cause like, is this good looking to anybody else? And then people in the comments were like kind of split on it, you know, whether it was good or bad. Um, but I just knew there was something to this, and it almost ended up on my sleepers list. Was it on my sleepers list? I can't even remember now. But still, I know I heavily considered this for my sleepers list. <laughs> and now I'm not even sure it should have been a sleeper. Apparently, a lot of people had their eye on it. It is in literally every Esper deck um, that I've seen since the MTGO challenges started. It is a uh, note, too, that Rafine crews this. So it's yet another two drop that the Esper decks will prioritize. Um, you play this on two, Rafine on three, crew this with the Rafine. Right. The Rafine explores and you can connive with this and put a counter on it or draw a card. It's gross. Absolutely gross. Absolutely gross. Like really good one or two, three combo there. But it also goes well with pretty much every other creature in the deck. Deep Cavern Bat crews it as well and then gets plus one plus one counters. So or you draw cards off of Deep Cavern Bat. Just a really, really sweet card. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. Um a lot more people should have seen this one coming too, honestly. Uh, two mana, three, four doesn't actually look like too much, but it, it can lead to a bunch of drawn cards or a bunch of plus one, plus one counters. It crews for the lowest amount possible and some of the best creatures in standard crew it in the best deck in standard. So just all those elements come together to make a card that is just practically very, very good and cannot be killed by go for the throat, which I think matters too. Just a lot of stuff going for a card like this. Can't be cut down. That also kind of matters. So just super stupid thing here. <laughs> Can't yeah, become a lightning strike too. That matters against mono red. So just kind of goes through a lot of removal too. Um, unbelievable in the early days, at least of the format performance from schooner here. Again, once we get more data in from tournaments, I'll be more comfortable doing like a top three or top five decks, new decks and standard sort of list. But I hope this kind of held you over and patrons quick word to you. I know you voted for the Bartholomew aristocrats deck on the Patreon poll. It blew away the Patreon poll this time around. I am doing that deck. Don't worry. It should be our next video, but I want to make it good. <laughs> it turns out I, I need an extra day or two to make sure that deck is good because I like the decks I present to be decent. Just let me know how you feel about everything in the comments section. What cards you're surprised to see here, not surprised to see here. What cards you expected to see that didn't show up, all that stuff. There's an awful lot to talk about. And the early days of standard are a great time to put our heads together on stuff like this. So I'm really interested in what you have to say about all this, but that's about it for now. Just check out the, uh, YouTube stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, check out the what, Dev? <laughs> My brain worked a little faster than me there. It happens all the time. But yeah, do the YouTube stuff. Like the video, sub to the sandwich if you haven't done it yet. We just got over 131,000 subs finally. That's awesome. Trying to hit 200K. Trying to hit 200K. Just need 69,000 subs. I know that's a very nice number, and you, you, you don't want it to be less than that because it's so nice. But just help me out. Sub to the channel if you haven't done it yet. There's a lot more content to be done very soon. In case you didn't hear me a second ago, Bartolome Aristocrats coming up very soon. And I kind of can't wait to do it. It's my favorite kind of deck. But I'm going to let you go for now. Um, that's about it. See ya. No, I'm not going to do the... <laughs> not going to do that to you. Basically, that's it. Just check out the Twitch if you want to see me play some Magic Live sometime very, very soon. Come into a city near you. And you can also check out the Patreon if you want to support the channel. It's just a dollar a month to do that. There are higher tiers, but all I really ask is a buck a month, and you can vote on deck techs if you do that. Links in the description for all that stuff. But aside from that, just let me know how you felt, and I'll catch you cats later. I'm Deb from The Place. Thanks for watching, Wizards. Spread love and be kind.